Hello and welcome to this episode of Superhero FX. Today we have some returning guests, Max and John from Superhuman Public Radio. It is an NPR style station, a podcast, a commentary on the entire superhero genre, and also just a great story. And these two guys have created it. I had them on to talk about season one a while ago. They're back with season two. And we're going to be talking with them not only about their uh, what they put out and sort of the thinking that goes into it, but what it means to talk about superheroes in an audio-only format. So let me just start with some introductions. Uh, Max, why don't you go first? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'm Maximilian Clark. I've been uh, the uh, co-creator with Jack on this. Uh, my background's in uh, film and web, and I'm... I don't know, I'm currently running three different uh, shows on three different networks. A, another fiction show for Good Story Guild and a non-fiction show for Podcast One. Uh, but, Superhuman Public ba- uh, but Superhuman Public Radio is my baby, and I love it so much. Uh, you can also find me like trolling uh, at QAnon events uh, on socials. <laughs> nice, nice, as you should be. Uh, and Mr. Dorsey. Yeah, and uh, I'm John, sometimes Jack. John Jack Dorsey, uh, co-creator of the show. Um, I produce less programs than Max, and beyond being a uh, podcaster and writer, I work as a union prop master in the DMV area. Awesome. awesome. A- a- DMV, that's the Department of Motor Vehicles? That's true. Department <laughs> of I am wherever you get your license plate. I, I was thinking, I mean, I've seen some DMV agents who I think think they are on set with the, like, level of pedantry, so that would make sense to me. Well, um, good good to have union folks involved. So, let me kind of just get started with, what is SPR? It is not Superhero Public Radio, as I put out under our uh, social media last time, and Maximilian was very kind enough to gently correct me. Uh, but what is Superhuman Public Radio? Yeah, uh, Superhero uh, Public Radio uh, would have been a good title, as it turns out, from an SEO sp- standpoint. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, but our stores are so decidedly that. human. See what I did there, Jack? I did. No, um, I, I like the branding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, uh, so we tell original um, stories uh, in a superhero world uh, through the lens of an NPR station. So uh, we... Uh, do in-depth uh, news reporting in our fictional world, uh, but we also uh, have segments like These American Supers or 100% Invisible that does um, deep dives into the lives and uh, behind the scenes of some of the things that make a superhero world work. Mm-hmm. And, it's, uh, yeah. the, the shorthand is it's what NPR would sound like if superheroes were real. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and um, yeah, when we just try to tell really personal original stories, it's a playground for us to like do little mm-hmm. thought experiments uh, on stuff, and you know, like all artists express their own world through goofy stuff. Right. Well, and I really love that. I, I think the the term "goofy" that you used is really perfect because it is both you, you give a great picture into the world, and I feel like you know it's funny. Yesterday, I started listening to a couple of the older episodes because I wanted to kind of have it in my head. And I wanted to all build up to the first episode and the trailer that you have out for season two, which we'll definitely talk about at a later point in the podcast. And I was thinking to myself, like, okay, I'll just listen to like three or four. And then I got so wrapped up in things that I couldn't stop. And so I had to be like, wait, no, how much time do I have before we record? Let me uh, uh, finish that this morning. And, I'm, and we'll talk more about the superhero side of it. But I want to hear you talk more about why NPR specifically. Like there are a lot – NPR is a very particular brand with very particular – sort of quirks that you really play into well you know everything from the kind of like gentle music in the like fresh air type segments and then this american life that is this american soups to the uh your version of click and clack the the clackett brothers of um car talk in uh what what, what is utility it utility belt talk? utility belt thank yeah. you um uh, um what was it about that kind of like because clearly uh, my sense is you both listen to a lot of npr uh, what was it that made you kind of choose NPR and kind of how how has it been like what have been your thoughts about what you're saying about that before you even get into the superhuman side of it? So a lot of it came from so the original idea for the show came from a you know I write movies that uh, nobody buys but I I wrote a gag into one of them you know that was essentially an NPR station called SPR and mm. me and Max worked on a project that was going to be an independent web pilot. And that didn't wind up going anywhere, but we talked about the project and, you know, both of us are um, dirty liberals. So we both listen to 
an incredible amount of NPR, but it was also mm-hmm. just the fact that if you look at their programming, it's less, it's, it's a lot of, it's not informative isn't the right word, but it's a lot of, you know, human stories and it felt very easy to kind of go from there and, you know, find a basis. The The first segment that was ever written on the show was the interview between Cosmos, who's our Superman analog, and uh, Kelly Close, who's basically Terry Gross. And from there, it just kind of felt like, oh, we should just really dig into that. And beyond that, the ethos that we have on the show because, you know, there's a lot of superhero parody out today. You know, you have Invincible and you have The Boys and, you know, they do a really good job of skewering comic book heroes. But we we like to use the phrase uh, it's it's parody with a purpose. Mm, yeah. So whenever yeah. we we pick a topic, we try to make sure like, OK, what are we actually saying about this? Yeah, yeah well, I mean, as someone on Reddit actually said it better than we did uh, uh where they said it's not so much a deconstruction of comic books as it is a deconstruction of the real world using comic books. Like, like we're, we're sad we're satirizing the news cycle more than we are um, comic books. But w- what I really like about the format too, is like, it gives us a lot of variety. Like, I mean, you named like five of our different shows. We have another one uh, based on serial uh, this season, uh, which yeah. is nice. going to be a lot of fun. And so we just get to attack it from a lot of different angles using a lot of different voices and, um, I mean, we have a 63-person cast. Like, we we get to make this big, immersive world. And we designed it in a way that, like, if you're playing in the car, like, and you're not paying attention, your brain will just say, like, hey, I'm listening to NPR uh, right now. And it's really cool to just sort of, like, yeah. be able to, like, create a world that feels very tangible uh, for people. That's been one of the big, great pieces of feedback we've gotten. One thing, if I understand how you're doing it, like, you got to pay the bills. and You do have advertising in it. But but you generally have an ad, like an actual ad from some company that I'm hoping you know helps help support you all, and then a fake ad that would exist in your world, and like th- there's one ad that, that played sometimes on mine that was you know for Nordstrom and I, so I can immediately tell, but there was another one that was for kind of this like kind of new advance in eyeglasses, and I honestly couldn't tell if it was an ad you had created or an ad someone had put in. That was helping to make you money, and because it came followed by your ad for uh, Spanko, I think, or not Spanko, that's a real thing. Uh, Spandexo. Span Spandexo, a yeah, family exactly. company. <laughs> and I just thought it was so brilliant that, like, I co- literally couldn't tell what was the ad from our own world and what was the ad internal to your own to your world. Oh, that's always fun to hear. Yeah, no, um, uh, we, we we typically uh, uh, like to play on like a lot of the uh, podcast ads you hear. Uh, we have um, like. Uh, over armor um uh this season um we have like um dollar shoe club and oh, sorry, yeah. dollar, dollar shave club um what was uh, the one from the first episode big ass shorts <laughs> um <laughs> yeah uh for 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 hulksters basically uh they, they're yep. extra stretchy um what was the what was the one that uh we did with uh squarespace uh shield space shield space that like builds yeah. your custom uh superhero layer in minutes and, and and plugs it in but uh yeah it's uh it's great uh, actually i think my favorite this season is going to be rings.com oh my uh, god yeah yeah that's uh episode six and if you want to hear why it's my favorite uh you know come back later but uh, I, was, look forward to it. I, I was thinking about this the other day because we made so in our first season like even for our press releases we did it all in universe we even got an email back from somebody who's like this is the weirdest <laughs> press release i've ever gotten I don't know what's happening, but yeah. I am going to publish this, which was kind of like, oh, that's great. But then a lot of people sort of missed out on the joke. So we've sort yeah. of we've dropped the mask a little bit. Yeah, uh, um, we're, we're on Fable and Folly uh, this season. And they listened to our trailer and looked at some of our promos. And they're like, hey, um, I, I we like the trailer. You never you never mentioned that it's like audio fiction and that people can listen to it and that you make episodes of the thing. And, yeah. and, and, and we both looked at each other and we're like, yes. Because like, in a trailer, that would be good for people yeah. to know that it's a show. <laughs> but I, that, that, that's a level of like dedication and immersiveness, you know, that, that feels like the equivalent of the actor who just like method, you know, is never yeah. breaking character. I like that. <laughs> yeah, no, but, we, uh, I mean, we might do it intellectually, but as it turns out, it's not like a great way to run a business. Yeah. <laughs> but it, 
I was I was I was really thinking about like why I love doing this, and I was, and I guess I still remain. Be, I was a huge fan of Lost, and yeah. specifically, I loved that expanded universe that they had with the Dharma Foundation, and they even published the book that Sawyer's reading in season one, and it felt like this this you know, it felt like this world that you could could scratch at just endlessly and find new nuggets of information which is what we've tried to do with the show and make sure it feels as real and seamless as possible right i mean we we have gags from the first season that people have not found Mm -hmm. that we like built into the website into the artwork and just (laughs) they're there Mm -hmm. well and folks listeners if you go back hopefully You've already listened to season one. If you haven't, definitely do so. Uh, and if you find some new ones, send them into us. I'll give you the contact information <laughs> at the end and make sure John and Mac- Max get tagged. Yeah, we'll send you a t-shirt. Um, yeah. Especially if you find the one that promises you a t-shirt. That's true. Awesome. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, and I I want to talk more about the superhero format that you guys are satirizing in a bit. But, uh, but I want to start just with what you said about the way you're kind of using superheroes as a method to make commentary on our own real world, because one of my favorite segments that I listened to from season one, so I feel okay spoiling, is about a man who gets rescued by a powerful woman, and he's so overwhelmed about the experience that he starts crying. And then he, like a picture of that gets taken, and it gets turned into a meme, and then that meme winds up getting used to support causes that he's totally against, and he talks about how much it affects his life. And as I was listening to that, I was struck by, I have heard this story. And if you take out the fact that it was a super person who rescued him, a, a woman superhero, and just make it some other embarrassing photo of him became an internet meme and has been online and caused this person harm, like, that's a real life story. And to me, that was a brilliant thing where you're just, you're making the superhumanness the, the cause of it. But it's really just an incredibly relatable real life situation. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's always the goal. Um, I love that segment too. Uh, uh, Jeff Grimwood is a guy I always try to plug into the things I use. Uh, he he plays the crybaby uh, mm-hmm. in that episode, and uh, God, he's just uh, he's just such a good performer. Um, I I think that's actually a good example of the mix we try to do, where we we, yeah. we like we look at something. Um, yeah, you know, and, and that actually goes the other way, because that's something that we think about a lot in comic worlds of, like, what is the traumatic ripple effect of being rescued, right? Yeah. Like, like people act like Superman pulls you out of a, like, erupting volcano, and then you're just fine. Um, but, like, yeah, just the, like, the unintended consequences um, from just any interaction you have in the superhero world fascinates us. And, um, yeah, and, uh, yeah, and we, we... We, we try to find, like, an emotional mirror when we're discussing something like that, and we're just like, yeah, do you know what that feels like? It feels like the unintentional consequences of these people that, like, like hide the pain herald. That's a real right. dude, right? Yeah. Like, 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 he has to go out and live his life with people just, like, giving him that, that little grin uh, at him. And, uh, like, all he did was sign up for a stock image, like, photo shoot. He probably got paid, yeah. like, 1200 bucks tops, and... Now his life is defined by this thing. And, and and I think that both of those stories are fascinating, and it's really cool when we get to mix them. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I apologize in advance for anyone who's going to feel chronologically challenged by this, but, you know, a lot of the kind of, like, pictures of young children that became internet memes, like, you know, angry baby or girl in front of fire with a mysterious smile on her face, like, those people are now adults, and, are, you know, they'll talk about how, like, they didn't even get paid 1200 bucks. Maybe their parents did. But, you know, they're constantly reminded of, you know, or they're trying to hide the fact that, please, no one rec- no one look at my baby pictures because you'll see that I'm that meme that everyone has seen. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, I mean, I think that's sort of, like, the weird thing about internet culture in general, too, mm-hmm. is, like, anything you do online could potentially, like, just spiral way out of control for right. no reason. And so you're now kind of at the point where, like, when you're here, or, or have you always been at this kind of point, or where where you're hearing a news story, or you're thinking about some new, you know, group of people who are getting screwed over, or some new kind of evil that's happening in our own world, or, you know, terrible thing, and thinking, okay, how can we make this a, uh, how can we 
put this into the superhuman world. It's definitely something that we talk about a lot, because even when you look at uh, just like the characters that already exist, Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, and if you look at the stories that really kind of carry through and are the ones that are iconic, they're the ones that are inspired by world world things. Uh, Clark Kent's whole identity is based in the fact that the writers were Jewish during a time when it was not cool to be Jewish, and they wrote this character that was about the fact they couldn't be their their real selves, they couldn't feel that they could live up to their potential, and they created Superman, and he's he's become this icon that, like, you know, is eternal. So yeah. when we're trying to tackle these stories, it's it's never... We, we almost never start with comics first. It is usually something going on in the world. So when we finished season one... Uh, you know, just like a couple weeks later, January 6th happened, and, you know, we we watched, I live outside of D.C., and I was holding my newborn son, and I was like, oh my god, is the United States gonna burn down? And that's made its way into the show. The The Women's March has made its way into the show. Um, yeah, I mean, Parkland, ha- yeah, I mean, season two, uh, it's been two and a half years since... Uh, season one ended, and in that time, uh, like I, I've been producing for my friend Walter Masterson for uh, like all that time, and he was at January six. Uh, I was only not there because uh, my wife uh, has a lung thing, and we didn't, we weren't. This is pre-vax, and I was like, oh no, like I can't wear a mask. Uh, like I'll join you for the inauguration. <laughs> uh, but like you know, we spent a lot of time in uh, the alt right spaces, and. Um, talking to people, like like having these deep conversations with QAnon, and that's uh, shaped one of our main antagonist groups in season two. Um, and uh, it's funny because some feedback that I've gotten uh, on our drafts is that uh, it seems like a caricature, and I'm like, and I have to explain, like, no, this is so authentic to the way that these yeah. that the that that the alt right is right now, like like. I am sometimes like lifting quotes uh, um, for our segments here. It just seems like two dimensional uh, satire yeah. because of uh, of the nature of the space. But um, yeah, like I don't know. This is, I mean, the, you know, the world's on fire, and this is how we cope. Yeah, yeah. What well, I mean, that's one thing I really appreciate because I think I've told the story before, but uh, I, I know I've told the story before, so I'm trying to make it brief. But I got into science fiction because my mother would sit me down to watch old episodes of Star Trek, the the original series. And she didn't care at all about the spaceships and, and that the science of it, but she wanted, you know, to talk to me at like age eight or nine about like, yeah, this episode where these people have different colors on their face. What do you think's going on there? And what does it have to think? Like, she she introduced me to the idea of science fiction as holding up a mirror to her own world. And mm-hmm. I figure like comics can do that. You guys are really doing that too and I, I love how intentional you're being about that. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. Thanks. I mean, I mean, that's I mean, that's why we tell stories, right? right. I mean, like, uh, like it's why literally any story exists is to convey something about the world. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, it's just nice that we have this like outlet where we get to like talk about so many different things. And uh, it also like it softens it, right? Like, like it's hard, like you know, our, our especially season two is incredibly political, but it is softened a little bit by the fact that you know we're talking about people who are concerned about getting melted in their seats uh you know by their classmates and that's why they want to ban supers from public schools you know yeah um you know it's just another way in what i go ahead please jack well i was just gonna say it's just the stories that you're talking about the ones that are taking on things in the real world those are the ones that you remember Mm -hmm. just just the sort of blank hero fights villain saves day you know, those are not the ones that stay with you because right. they're kind of inherently hollow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I mean, not to diss sky beams, <laughs> but uh, I mean, how many of us really think about sky beams in your day to day life? Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Well, and I I'm, I'm so tempted. To, on the one hand, I want to ask you more about season two, but I also with every media I cover have such a strong anti spoilers policy that I don't <laughs> want to go too deep. But I just what you said about like this idea of students being afraid that someone else is going to you know melt them in their seat. 
you know, I, I on the one hand, I get that there's a humor there of, oh, that is such a ridiculous fear compared to our own worlds. But also, if you listen to people who are afraid of, you know, and I'm sure this is kind of where you're going, you know, trans kids in their school or, you know, uh, certain books on the bookshelves, those fears are actually just as fictionally ridiculous as the they're going to melt me in my seat. But that's what we're dealing with in our own world. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it is very believable. Yeah, uh, I I mean, I guess no official comment given the spoiler. Uh, it's well, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a spoiler to say when we were initially and and you can kind of see because we wrote this over we we wrote the season over last year right. but we had been talking about it for a year before and it it, it took us a while because i got covid Max I, got I, COVID. I i had long covid i was asleep he, for he like long COVID. six months I, i've got a toddler you know i was working on a tv show so everything was getting in the way and originally we had you know imagine sort of like you know this sort of Q kind of figure, uh, you know, leaking something about a storyline that is so gone. And that was back when Q was like, ha ha, look at this cute thing these fringe people are doing. And it's like, by the time we started writing, that is really bad. Uh, this is incredibly dangerous. And then started thinking more about kind of our world and sort of the pieces on the table. Well, I mean, I think that storyline got kind of absorbed by what we are doing. But it's it, also it, like, it yeah. did. But yeah. one of the things that we, we did is just kind of you, we looked at where the baton was in season one and we're trying to figure out, okay, who's going to pick this up? You know, at yeah. the end of the, our first season, the, the United States is considering publicly registering all superhumans. Right. So it's, you know, what's that the response to that? You're going to have people who are for it, who are, you know, right. alt right, and then you're going to have well, you know, I mean, who's centrist people too and, who also are like caught up in the well you know i hear i hear these things yeah and then it's how are how are young people going to respond you know obviously yeah. you know x-men has been sort of overtly and unintentionally political throughout its run so kind of you know how are the youth gonna yeah going to right. respond to this well, you know, I, what's going to be the corporate response and and it's worth pointing out there that like you know, it's it's funny because like we talk about things that are topical to a certain extent, but it's like, you know, the cyclical nature of history. We're doing the Mutant Registration Act. I mean, when was that storyline first put out? Like like yeah. the first time that X Men talked about that. But like, what's old is new again, right? It's just mm -hmm. there are certain societal dynamics that just keep rearing their ugly heads, and um, you know, we we try to bring a fresh perspective, but like you know, it's. Yeah, you know, it's 2023, and here we are again. Yeah, you have people saying, "I, I." The thing that drives, you know, I'm in DC Comics Twitter, Marvel Twitter, and every once in a while you'll see it's just like, "Oh my gosh, this book got political," and like people will be saying this about the, <laughs> yeah. they'll be saying it about the X Men, a book where the leaders were based on MLK and Malcolm X, and like, it makes my head want to explode every time, and they're trying to get everything scrubbed. Yeah. out of comics i don't know if you're uh familiar with like the comics code authority which was oh, basically quite a bit yeah right and like people are essentially asking for this thing to return and while yeah. like some very cool art kind of eked by just sort of how you know there's a lot of very uh co not controversial but artistically done films who are trying to dodge like the Hayes code it just seems weird that people are trying to muzzle themselves so that they don't have artwork that challenges any idea that they might have. You know, it, it, it's so true. And we, we've done a, a couple episodes on the history of comics on this podcast. And, you know, for those folks who say, like, why is it so woke now? You know, the first literal episode of Superman, some of the villains he deals with, are a greedy landlord who's overcharging tenants because they have nowhere else to go, and a person who's, uh, you know, committing intimate partner violence against their spouse, and a, a man who's beating his wife, and like those certainly aren't issues in our own world anymore, uh, but they were they're very political now, and they were just as political then. Jack Kirby, I'm convinced, created Captain America because he wanted the U.S. government to pay him to go over and punch Nazis in the army, and. It was 1939, and we weren't fighting the Nazis yet. So he created a person who could punch Nazis because that's what he wanted to do. Um, 
So yeah. And that's actually a great segment because there there's a way in which and I never really put this together until I was listening to this epi- these episodes again. There is a huge frustration I have with the comic book superhero genre that you guys are addressing in a way I'd never really thought about before. And I, I want to talk to you about it and wonder how much this is intentional. Because, like, take Captain America Civil War, probably my favorite comic movie, one of them, in part because I think the question of if people have the ability to use violence to do what they think is right to what extent should they be accountable to others? And what happens if that accountability isn't good accountability and the dangers of both sides? And what I want is Tony and Steve to sit in a room and debate it for two hours. But that doesn't sell tickets. And so instead, one of them states their point and the other states their point, and then they start to punch each other. Or, you know, T'Challa has his idea about how a powerful black nation should act, and Killmonger has his idea... And they state it once or twice, and then they start punching each other, because that's what looks good on screen and on comic book pages. You guys are, are telling a story about superheroes and supervillains and superpowered people where you have some cool sound effects every now and then, but you can't really do a fight scene. And so you're giving me kind of what I wanted there in that it is all just the talking. It's all the let's we don't have to put up a huge spectacle on screen. So we can just go so much deeper in those conversations. I, to what extent is that something that's been conscious in your head? Is it something you just kind of stumbled into? Because it, it seems like such a brilliant part of this is that you can go deeper in a way that when it's on the page or on the, the screen and people are expecting the visual side of it, that so often gets lost. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, something I like about comics is the ability to maintain a conversation through an action scene. Right, like yeah, um, that's fair. that, like uh, you know, but it's just that not everyone does it. But yeah. like, like you know, I mean, Alan Moore doesn't like stop talking. Yeah, no, uh, that, that's fair. I, yeah. I maybe should have said it's more about the on screen yes. than on page. Yeah, yeah. And, and and I think that's frustrating because cool, like the int- it's it's a very corporatized model, right? Like like the MCU, mm-hmm. the, like 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 these are these are products more than they are stories. Right. Uh, to a certain extent, right? And so having a, like, you know, it's, it's like, if you have to drop a character because it's not going to test well in China, or, or they're not going to screen it in China, you are no longer making art. Right. Right? You are making a product. And I, I think that a lot of the filmmakers, like we, like uh, Jack mentioned with, like, uh, the Hays Code, it's like, they find a way to insert it, right? But, but, but like, they, they are overcoming the, yeah. the, um the mission and uh i think because jack and i have no one giving us money or setting expectations for us we get to just uh say uh uh things freely and like you know maintain a viewpoint i i, I yeah and I, th- I, th- I think this season we are bringing a little bit more action in but it's audio so it's it's like zip yeah. zip talk 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 it is <laughs> but you know like a catchphrase we use for the show is you know these are the stories between the panels mm-hmm. you know and it that. actually and it actually goes on just uh, i'll go on to say like you know this is what happens after the punching is done and the hero flies away because you know as max said we're not beholden to disney or anybody or even readers like we're just gonna we're just gonna have these characters wind up where they wind up mm-hmm. you know one of the big storylines that we have that we carry through is, you know, our, our Superman analog cosmos. You know, he got deported last season. He's now on an island with a bunch of other people that have been rejected by the countries where they are from. And it's this question of, and this isn't a spoiler because we talked a lot about Magneto. Yeah. And sort of what would happen with him because, you know, we've seen a lot of evil Superman, but we've never seen, we've never seen a... Superman who's just kind of dealing with the consequences of his actions and just with how people treat him. And we had a lot of conversations about where this guy would end up, where is his head, and what's going to happen because of it. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 the, and the interesting thing about Superman to us is the restraint, is the responsibility that he feels. But, um, like, we're, we, yeah, we experimented a lot with untethering that from the rule of law and like, like what happens when Superman gets to pursue his own idea of justice, which is like what the versions of Magneto we like best does. It's like, 
if I, you know, if, you know, if this is Malcolm X, like, like, what is the, you know, just response, not necessarily the lawful response? Yeah. No, I think that makes so much sense. I mean, especially as, and, and you know, and there's a lot, we actually did an episode recently on, on the X-Men and how the, the Malcolm X, Martin Luther King comparison doesn't always hold up mm-hmm. directly, but it certainly does in terms of the American perception of those two characters. And that one thing I think is fascinating about the X-Men is how the way Malcolm X was perceived by most of America in the 60s uh, really reflected who Mal- who Magneto was today, who at then, you know, today a lot of people have read the autobiography of Malcolm X. Like, he's not seen as the villain, whereas Martin Luther King was the good guy. And, and, and the perception of Magneto, I think, has changed in a lot of similar ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's, I love be, how you can uh, address those things and, and keep those stories going. And a, and a big piece of that is also consequence. Mm-hmm. We try to make sure that if something happens, then we're going to try try and take it to like its, more, its most natural and most dramatic point. Yeah. Because, you know, comics are super guilty of, you know, these huge storylines will happen. And then because there's a change in editorial, like, no, you know, it's all reset. Like, I, I'm right. a huge fan of Tom King. His run on Batman was essentially uh, a relationship drama between Batman and Catwoman, mm-hmm. where they get married and kind of what are the stresses of all of that. And I, I like his comics because he writes very adult storylines and not in the sense of adult. There's nudity and gore and violence. It's more... Well, here here's something that's actually going to be interesting to you, you know, thirty five and up man. Um, and then immediately after his run was done, they're like, "No, this is <laughs> not married anymore. Like, let's mm-hmm. throw it all away." And we we're not going to do that. Uh, these yeah. these yeah. characters are going to change when something big happens. It's going to affect everyone. Yeah, and 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 we try. I mean, as hard as we can, as two people who have. I mean, season two was like 350 pages uh so uh but we try our best to maintain continuity uh on my wall i have a map of the u.s with little posted flags of every story we run just in case something happens in the area we'd be like oh wait do you know what happened in this area in in season one right like like mm. like because you know we said a story in the southwest we we're like okay Hilo monster is the legion hero that's that's uh you know assigned to this district um, and so what do we know about this? Like, like, how's that going to affect right. things? Um, which is extremely annoying to do. And I do not recommend it for any creative. <laughs> just well, wing it's, it, guys. It, it's, it's also, we're a two man team. Yeah. Not only doing the business and the directing and the editing and the voice, it, like just everything. And we just need like a writer's assistant, but Again, we have no money, so we can't be like, come work for us for not even exposure. You'll just be working in the dark. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying hard not to make myself volunteer for that role, but that's the story entirely. But no, I, I really get it. And I there's like five conversational directions I can take that in. But just just staying on this for one more second, mm-hmm. that line about the stories between the panels. For me, the thing that I've always been so fascinated by and where a lot of this podcast has gone it is that is the. What happens to the people below the page? You know, what happens to the people who are affected by all this? And as you said, you know, if you're going to pay Chris Hemsworth a huge amount of money, you're, you're mostly going to keep him on stage. You're not going to have uh, on screen. You, you might get the few moments that we got in one of the Avengers movies of a support group of people who are affected by the blip in the MCU. But that's not the main part of the story. And I just... That, as a sociologist, a theologian, and something like that, that's what's fascinating yeah. to me. You know, in the boys, uh, uh, they do this really interesting plot line of a religion that would form and how that would change. And like, you know, Zack Snyder Superman it explored that for like five seconds, but then moved on. But then I know you guys, my understanding is going to go deeper and things like that. I think there's just, for me, there's something really fascinating about ask asking. How would society change when these superhumans exist? And I, I, I just would love to hear you talk more about kind of your thinking on that and how you're exploring that side of it. Yeah, uh, Jack actually had a people worshiping Cosmos uh, story that disappeared. It still somewhere. exists in a mm-hmm. folder somewhere because I yeah. couldn't quite figure out the way to break it. But it was we were gonna. It was a segment that was going to be about 
someone who is specifically writing about superhero cults. Yep. And it was it was based on an interview I had heard somewhere on the radio with a woman who was who was talking about cult leaders because mm-hmm. I was yeah, you know, it's a, it's again I, I I like you, I just I'm endlessly fascinated by okay, who's like who's the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern of this world? Yeah. And mm-hmm. what are the reactions to all that? One of my favorite, you know, we had talked about the X-Men. One of my favorite runs was um the X Force, where Multiple Man is a PI in Mutant Town and and New York, and you know it's again it's the street level hero, and you get to see how these mutants are getting treated, and the issues and trials of their lives, and you know they were lower stakes stories, and obviously we do high stakes stories, but we also kind of delight in what are going to be, you know what's what's going to be the 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 macro lens of what's going on in this world. And we can go further and further to the ground and, and look up instead of being that person in the sky looking down. Yeah. Uh, and, and we also, we have a lot of anime influences. I mean, you'll see traces of my hero and uh, one punch man on this, but uh, something I really love about attack on Titan is they will spend 90 seconds on a random apartment of characters you've never met. And it's just like a, you know, an old woman teaching her granddaughter how to knit. And they're have finally getting their life back on track. And then, boom, of like a giant fist comes through and kills them all. And what, like when you zoom out, that's like every time a building gets destroyed. That's happening, yeah. right? Like, you know, we, like, you know, 9-11 was a week ago. And, you know, you hear these personal stories of when the tower fell. Like, every individual life of their was a story and like, and we never get them and it makes the destruction feel so small, right? If you destroy a city of nobodies, I mean, what do they say? Like a person dies, it's a tragedy. A million people dies is a statistic, right? And, And it just like, there's no emotional impact, but in attack and Titan, you show that scene for a minute. And then when that building goes down, like your heart just squeezes, yeah. Um, yeah, I did, yeah, I had to take a break from that show yeah. because I, I, did, I just can't take it anymore. Fatherhood, huh? Oh, I mean, that'll, I, yeah. A long time ago, I, I used to love watching Law and Order, and my, my views on the police and the way police are treated in media have changed a lot. But, mm-hmm. but still, one thing I always remember is they would always have like three to five minutes of either the people who are having this argument and they come across the dead body. And or whatever it is, and I'd often feel like, no, 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 I want to know more about that story. Like, what yeah. happened when she got back from the club? You know, <laughs> like, um, I mean, such a great thing. But you know, another one of my favorite segments you guys did in season one was about um, the people who have powers that aren't actually that useful. And you have this great thing about a woman who can turn uh, pickles back into cucumbers and things like that. that and... That's actually uh, season two. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. It is season two. Um, and I just I loved it because like. When I talked to my friends about the X-Men, that was always my comment was, how is it that these completely random genetic mutations always seem to be so useful in combat? Um, you know, and what about the people, like, if it is just random genetic mutation, aren't some of them totally useless? And you guys not only addressed that, but talked about how that would be pretty devastating to find out you're a superhuman in a completely useless way. Yeah. Um, yeah, that segment actually used to be um, almost twice as long, uh, too. Uh-huh. Uh, just really going into like, yeah, like like the, the idea that like, if your superpowers you can jump six inches higher, you don't know you have a super a, a superpower. You think you're really good at track and field, like you're great at basketball. You jump a foot yeah. and you go to the NBA. You jump twenty feet and you're a superhero. And it's like that idea of degrees and how. Um, yeah, I I, 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 st- I still uh, wish there was a way that uh, that could have made the final draft, but uh, um, but um, but yeah, just like these like small little like 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 it's a complete world, right? Like you look at um, you know Xavier School for the Gifted, and you know they're recruiting for their paramilitary force, right? Like like you know I'm sure that there's the person who can tell you how many pulls a uh, ceiling fan has before it turns off, but like you know they're not going to go in the Blackbird. Yeah. Well, and so let's start talking about season two. And I, I want to hear more about uh, the overall process. But I want to start with how, how I got a little bit involved with this. Because I think it 
it really speaks to your writing process in a way that we talk about so often is missing. Um, it's the idea of representation, not only on screen, but in the writer's room, because, and I, and we'll talk much more about this in the future. I have another episode with these folks planned after a much later episode, which also, for those of you who are wondering, you're yelling at your radios or your, your podcast things of like, forget about spoilers, Matthew, ask them more about upcoming storylines. We'll get to talk to you much more about the upcoming storylines when we do that. But the reason we're doing that is because I know that disability is going to be a theme you explore. And I know that because you all approached me, a disabled person, and asked me to kind of like look at a script and look at some of these ideas and, and talk with you through it, which I really loved. And, and in talking to you more, I got, uh, my, my understanding is that, yeah, when you cover trans issues, you like reached out to people in that community and things like that. That is something that so often is missing and that we'll often hear, you know, you'll look at a character and people from a community will be like, clearly they didn't like that character was written by people who don't understand that community. Talk to us about like how that was a part of your writing process and and why. I I I think it's well personally you know I come from a film background so I've like been around writers and I've heard how they run rooms but it's also just we're two straight white guys and you know you can come up with a great idea for a story and you can there's nothing that stops you from imagining somebody who's you know LGBT or you know, who, who is disabled, but then once you're going to put that story out into the world, you know, you're also representing those people, and if you have zero input from them, it just, you know, it, it does not take much to make sure that you are doing right by a community by reaching out. You know, we have people in our writer's room this season who were queer, who gave us feedback on stories that, you know, that weren't overtly queer, but dealt with those storylines and they certainly weighed in on them. Mm-hmm. It's just, it, sh- it, it, it's, it's the way people should do it. It just, it feels like this should be common practice these days. Well, you know, I think there was this toxic thing that went around uh, studio execs in like, I don't know, 2015 is when I first remember hearing it. The, uh, this idea of write what you know, but they misinterpreted it. They're like, Oh, you're a banker. You should write about banking. Like, like this is great. You have a like, like it's like because the idea isn't that you can only write things that you yourself have lived. It's that when you write something, you should be knowledgeable in it, and you it should be a in conversation with people, like who have lived those experiences in order right. to bring it to life. I mean, because not everyone's a writer, but you know, everyone has you know distinct viewpoints and perspectives, and it's important to collect those as you're. As you're writing yeah. things, and I, I, I love that, like you know, and our, like you know, we try also like in casting to like make sure that we create opportunities for uh, a- actors of all walks of life, and really like as we're going, just like you know, uh, whenever I direct someone, I always like try to like check in, like even regional things, like like when a character's from the south, uh, mm-hmm. in places I've never been, and it's like, is this Foghorn Leghorn? Is this like did I just did I hear this? in a Looney Tunes and write this down. Uh, can, can, like, how would you say this? And, you know, just fine tuning it. Um, yeah. Cause when, I mean, you know, it's when it doesn't hit, it's just a minstrel show. Like it's not like, yeah, it's not substantive. And I love how you're talking about that with a really both and perspective, because like, yeah, you're right. The, the right, what you know, can sometimes be so no more, like learn more about something before trying to write about it. Mm-hmm. But also I think sometimes that can be, oh, I've got a trans friend and I read one book about being trans. So now I know how to write trans people. And I like what you guys are saying of that both you want to educate yourselves so that you know more, but then also you're bringing those people into the writing room Mm -hmm. and, and they're writers, not just, you know, your friend you had one conversation with. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, I, I, you know, I guess the part I didn't say is like, if you just write what you know and you stay in your uh, box, then like, you know, Guys like us will only write boring stories about straight white dudes. No, thank you. Yeah. Which is a lot of what we get. Right. Exactly. Yo, no, yeah. Be- yeah, because of the way the note is usually assigned to people. But it's also just it's an opportunity for different voices. My favorite segment on this season period is in the next episode, and it is one that someone else pitched and wrote. And it's uh, a writer named Rachel Music. Uh, she's working with Max on another series right now mm-hmm. called Josie and Josie's Lonely Hearts Club. Jo- Josie's Lonely Hearts Club. 
and she uh, she had heard the show. She approached Max at uh, the Catalyst Festival. Mm-hmm. She's become part of our writing team, and she's just she's one of the strongest writers that we have. And mm-hmm. again, like one of my favorite favorite pieces, like it, it came out of her. And had we not thought like, hey, we need women in the writing room because it's otherwise it's just me and Max making unblinking eye contact for like <laughs> days, which, you know, some gold nuggets come out of. But there is uh, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, dry poop that falls out of there as well. Right. So, hey, hey there we are. Forty seven minutes in before Jack mentions poop. This is yeah. a miracle. Our, our recording sessions when he does his parts, it's just poop, 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 poop. It, no, it's not poop. It's specifically my armpit butthole. Yes, I was trying which to Which is a piece of relationship lore listeners. between me and my wife that has somehow bled into our recording sessions. Oh, my goodness. So moving back to... <laughs> 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 it's awesome. I love it. Um, but yeah, no, I love that idea of the process. And like, so, so talk more about, in, in writing season two, I imagine... There's a lot of lessons learned from season one. Mm-hmm. Uh, what what did you learn after doing it that you wanted to kind of either like, oh, let's do more of that in season two, or maybe this was like, we could have done this better or d- differently, or what What was that process like? What'd you learn from doing the first season of this? So a big piece was we kind of had a main character in uh, Stephen Singh, who's our newsreader, and uh, spoilers, he dies. And he's essentially... We knew we wanted a sort of death of Superman storyline for the first season, mm-hmm. which I will admit was kind of for the shock factor. We we decided it was going to be somebody's voice who our audience was going to hear all the time. And through killing this character off and it became this kind of big tipping point for the world and the politics of the world, we decided, OK, we we need we're going to need main characters. We're going to need somebody that folks can grab onto. I mean, my, one of my favorite characters on the show is Wizkid, and, you know, he doesn't essentially have a story right now. So we, we wanted to go back, figure out, okay, who's the heart of the show. And mm-hmm. we, and it was a throwaway line that Steven Singh had two daughters and we had just, it was something I wrote in as a little bit of, Hey, it's even worse that this guy died because he has kids. But then we were talking like, oh, where's season two going to go? Who are we going to follow? And we had started thinking about, okay, this act is going to come, this the super act is coming out. Coming out. You know, there's going to be pro-registration. There's going to be people who are anti. And we've, we've decided that his daughters are essentially going to be on different sides of this issue. So you're going to meet Apoorva Singh, who is Stephen's eldest daughter, who works for SPR and is balancing her life of being a reporter with her feelings towards what's happening in the world and his youngest daughter, Juhi Singh, who is an activist. And we don't, because we like to present the world, we don't like just saying like, Hey, here's the main character. You're following them now. They, we kind of slowly get to know them. And, you know, this isn't spoilers for the season, but you know, really everything's going to revolve around these two young women. And, Especially as we go into season three, yeah. And especially as we go into season three, yeah. but it it became, you know, we started caring about these characters more. And yeah, well, I mean, I mean, I mean, that was really huge for us because you know the first season is very anthology based it's for a the most part. Show. Like, yeah, I mean, you know, because like we do like we we have these big emotional beats, but then we weave the characters for the most part, and uh, we found that we tended to miss them and like yeah and and that like you know because we are ter- telling a, a a fictional story that like yeah this like we we wanted to find more ways to make it um uh uh and to to find an overarching narrative and like you know as right. jack was saying like 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 to make it about characters that we care about and come back to but also have storylines that really feel like you're progressing as you listen uh to it and so uh Season two, definitely listen to it in order. Uh, there's going to be yeah. some really cool stuff that happens as the season progresses. No, and I, I think I'm really interested in that that as well. First of all, it's one thing I noticed with Steven, Steven Singh when I was listening to it is, because here again, how representation matters in a way that you don't have to lampshade it. You know, that last name sounds South Asian, but it, it's not a, a character beat at all. And then when I heard his 
daughter's names mentioned and they both also were South Asian. I was like, oh, that is just such, again, a brilliant part of just making this feel like a real part of our world. Mm-hmm. Um, and th- here I want to – it's such a brilliant part of it that I don't want to spoil anything, so I'm going to be as vague as I can here. In the first season, you have someone call in to your car talk story where it sounds like something bad happens on air to that person and uh, you're not sure about it. And then I heard in the trailer that that storyline is get further explored. And mm, I was like, oh, mm-hmm. that is so cool mm-hmm. how, you know, because, c- yeah, th- like I, it made me wonder and I, I might Google this at some point or maybe, you know, like, has anybody ever called in to uh, I, I guess probably not because it's it, like, no, well, let me say like it made me wonder, like, has anyone ever called in? Like, while they were driving to click and clack it, and then, like, people heard an accident happen on air or something terrible like that. Oh, my God. Um, pro- pro- probably probably not on Car Talk. Pro- no, probably, nothing but... that dramatic. And, and we can talk about it. So well, we have a... Uh, well... We can. I mean, we it doesn't can... spoil anything. Yeah, I guess it's in the season two trailer. But, yeah, so... uh, look, if, you're, if you haven't listened to episode four of season one, stop now. Go over. <laughs> listen to go. it. All right. The short but episodes it, are like twenty minutes long. Yeah, but it's right, it's essentially our world's Robin, you know, stole the Batmobile and he calls into the to to the show asking for help and then you know it disappears under mysterious circumstances and a new segment on the show which you know we had tried to figure out how to do on the first season but we just we never could yep. find the end and after writing that segment it was like oh our show on serial should be about this this young sidekick who disappears and what happened to him yeah i mean i mean essentially so, we're doing you know jason todd yeah yeah right and uh as our version of serial uh which is a lot of fun and jack wrote these uh four uh episodes and uh they are so good and the build <laughs> is so satisfying and it, it's just like introduces true crime into the season uh which is just a lot of fun that. oh god it's so, so much fun yeah um yeah yeah and uh, also like i don't know just like on 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 the uh steven singh diversity thing it's like you know uh sean ahmed who plays um uh steven singh is great and we hated killing him off because he's like one of the best supporters Mm -hmm. of our show works all the time does hallmark movies great actor he was he was in the expanse yeah and yeah when he told me that i was like wait and he told and his scene is you know he, he plays uh he's he he's a character actor you know and i remembered his scene like his scene popped out i was like oh my god we got that guy yeah like, um yeah no it, it was great but uh but when we cast uh his daughters uh you know we 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 heard a lot of uh indian american uh actresses and it was actually god i i, I have such mixed feelings about it but like uh like whenever we uh, did the cold reads and auditions, and when I brought them in, they're like, uh, "So, like, do you want the accent?" I was like, "Why? You grew up here," and yeah, and man. just like the look of relief on their face. Yeah, like it's just like because you know, I mean, you know, we don't cast people for their diversity for the most part, but like, you know, we try to get down to people from a mix of different places. But it's like, you know, because their legitimate perspectives matter, not because we want to do like. Little Sam caricatures the, the, and, the, and it's so the good. Context, and it's, it makes it so big. That's why we have so many actors. Yeah, but also you know the context helps. Yeah, there might be something that we wrote that was wrong, and also yeah. we found a lot of you know we found a lot of really talented women through this, who we you know cast in in other roles outside of these two leading roles. Um, probably one of our favorite voices of the season came from this casting call, and I don't know if she would have oh, auditioned oh, for the oh, show. Oh, and Jolly, like oh Jolly, God, she's so good. Oh. She she disappears, and what oh. what is her last name? Yeah, no, she has one of sixty three people in the. <laughs> okay, so it, Max is gonna look up her last name. Anyways, this this woman who auditioned for us specifically because we were looking for, you know, women of of Indian descent, she came in, and throughout the season, when she plays characters, I. You know, because I'm straighter. pretty removed Follow from the left. editing program, I would always ask Max, wait, which actress is this? And he'd be like, it's Anjali. And she would just vanish into a role. Yeah, and uh, it Karana. Was... Yeah. And. Uh, Anjali Karana. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, no, right. and, and, and like, like, like try to listen to her voice without falling a little bit in love with her. Like, it, it, it's tough. 
and and, and, but, and she plays a, a a good spread uh throughout she has a really um good part in episode seven uh, God, well, so and i just think that what you're talking about that is so important because yeah like it'd be great to get you know if you do a story that is mirroring something happening in south asia or india or pakistan or whatever to get actors from that world to do it but that they don't have to you know like i and that their story doesn't have to be about that. Uh, you can have a story about a reporter who is an Indian man, mm-hmm. but that's not what the story is about. I, you know, growing up, recognizing that I was bisexual when I was like 16 or so, you know, and I was growing up in the 80s and 90s. And it was great at first that gay men and queer men were finally appearing on screen, but they were all dying of AIDS, mm-hmm. which was, yes, a very real story. But I still remember how important it was to me when that there was a queer man who was on screen but his queerness wasn't his character arc. His character arc was about something different. It just happened to be that the person he went home to was a man instead of a, a woman. And and so I think the way you're doing that makes so much sense. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I live in New York, right? I mean, like, like yeah. I look at the like WNYC news team or any of the TV news team, and it's a big mix of people, right? And it's yeah. like and it's just our desire to make the world feel authentic, right? Like we need a giant mix of human beings, uh, like, and also like. This is something my wife talks about a lot. Um, a lot of older actors, too. Um, which, mm. um, it feels weird that they don't... That people just aren't casting older actors as protagonists and things. Like, I don't know how important it is for them to be sexy in, like, a horror movie. Uh, yeah. Because, um, like, there's some such good talent out there, and they're bored as hell. They're just so bored doing, like, old person parts. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, instead no, of just sure. like parts. Yeah, makes total sense. Um, anything else? I want to uh, not take too much more of our time, and in our uh, members only section, we're going to talk about a different part of geekiness that I wonder if it's in, uh, impacted how you do your world building because it certainly is what I thought of. But just for kind of like wrapping up, is there any other last things you guys want to say about lessons learned from season one, or things, you're, and how that plays into season two, or other stuff that about season two you want to get uh, get into? I mean, one big thing out of season one is we made the decision to go bigger. Um, mm. We wanted to, like, you know, everything was in world, and we, we told, like, these quiet little stories throughout. Um, but, like, at the end of it, it's like, you know, we're in total control of this. We could do whatever the hell we want. Like, mm. let's, let's like, up the ante. And, and, you know, it created so much more work for us. Season two is 100 pages longer than season uh, one was. Yeah. Um, and, uh, like, a bunch more characters, a bunch more like set pieces and things like that and it's so fun the fact that we just like let ourselves like go off that's awesome uh jack it's just i would say for season two it's just it's more serialized Mm -hmm. you know we we really wanted season one to feel a little bit more variety show there's obviously an a story but for this second season we the story definitely takes bigger swings episode to episode and certainly from our first half and the second half because we're going to have a two episode break where me and max are going to interview each other about uh behind the scenes and things we might not have told each other about in sort of the inspiration of the show and it'll be about the podcasts that have inspired it and then another episode that's just absolutely about the comics that inspire it and mostly that exists so max gets a break because uh if he hasn't said it he's our series director and editor well, as the co-producer, so he uh, wears a lot of hats and uh, <laughs> needs needs time. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm. We are. We release season. We re- we release episode two uh, on Wednesday of this week, and I have the first six done, and then there's another six episodes that are not quite done, <laughs> and so <laughs> those uh, two weeks are going to be great. I understand that. I understand that. Well, yeah, it, it is really wonderful what you're doing with it. It's and I'll say this kind of especially about the directing part, like in terms of like the music and things like that, one thing I think is so interesting. I'm also a liberal. I'm a New Yorker. I'm a lifelong NPR listener. And I love that you manage to poke gentle fun at some of the NPR things without it becoming satire without, well, I mean, it's satire, but without it becoming mockery. <laughs> like there are times where the music is, like and every now and then I'll kind of roll my eyes a little the way I roll my eyes about that music during an NPR segment. But I'm also, there are other times where the music is just, it's having the effect on me 
that the music during NPR has. And I'm just like, oh, that's it, it's such a hard line to walk that it's it's tribute to NPR as much as it's poking gentle fun of it. But also it's, it's just recreation of that in ways that I just think are 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 brilliant. Yeah. Well, th- thanks. I mean, we love comics. We love NPR. We yeah. hate the world. And so NPR. So so so, so our show like, you know, it satirizes the things we hate using the things we love. Yeah, hey. I love that. I love how you're doing that. Well, and, and that's maybe my last question. You're doing this all in NPR and showing us what NPR is like, and I, I hope you stick with that. But will we ever have, like, play a moment from the CNN of your world or of the, sh- like, the sh- have a segment about, well, we all know that, you know, Blonde Banity uh, gave a speech last night. Like, yeah, talk about that. Uh, well, uh, it was a Patreon exclusive uh, with season one, but we uh, released it on April Fool's Day. Um, we have an episode from the Villainous League news. On, yeah. on our stream. Oh, I love this. Uh, and you can hear great shows such as Wait, Wait, Don't Kill Me uh, <laughs> and Throx and Friends. Um, I like it. I and like uh, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's uh, episode 13. Is that what we called it? It's a, it's episode 13 yeah. live from VLN. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we uh, we have that a little bit. And, um, you know. Our, our third season is going to shift perspectives a lot. Yeah, a little bit. Um, when we get there, uh, mm-hmm. we can't say how. Okay. Yeah, but you'll you'll, you'll understand trick, why by the end uh, of the season amount, two. The amount of work that we give ourselves, and specifically, uh, we're gonna just dogpile on Max in season three, is going to be so big, but so worth it. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love. It. Well, yeah. I can't wait. And for those people who um, are hearing about you guys for the first time now, or just want to hear more. First of all, tell us how we can find superhero. Super. Let me do it. First of all, tell us how we can find Superhuman Public Radio, but then also how we can find some of the other creative projects or, or commentary places that that Max and John are up to. Uh, sure, Superhuman Public Radio. Uh, if you just search for that on any uh, place you get your podcasts, uh, also SPR Pod is all of our social he- uh, handles. It's our website, sprpod.com. Um, and uh, we are also like doing some like social media stuff uh this season will behind the scenes and stuff you follow yeah, us on awesome. tiktok and insta um yeah jack keeps saying i need to make a website uh for things um yeah um yeah uh you can hear me and uh walter uh go inside QAnon and uh you know mock moms for liberty and matt gates and folks uh to their face um we have a show uh coming up uh called we are not journalists um uh, which does uh, in-depth dives uh, from people who are asking the question journalists are too smart to ask. And uh, on Good Story Guild, coming January, uh, we have Josie's Lonely Hearts Club, uh, which is a fake AM romance uh, love mm-hmm. guru show uh, with a bunch of improvisers that I uh, throw at the host, and it's a lot of fun. And that is conjunction with series writer Rachel Music, yeah. who is pretty much the star of episode two, which comes out this Wednesday. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. We're recording this about a week and a half before this episode will come out. So Last it, Wednesday. All that stuff will be uh, yeah. available by the time this all comes out. <laughs> yeah. And um, uh, if you want to find me, just look me up at JNDIV uh, pretty much anywhere. Uh, this winter, I will be coming out with uh, my friend's comedy special, which I directed and produced over the summer. Yeah. Oh, awesome. J N D I V. That's John Nelson Dorsey the fourth. J N D I V. Yeah. Did you just get that? Uh, no, I just thought it would be <laughs> useful for people who can't. Uh, like, if you spell like something in front of a toddler, I won't get it. And so I thought it'd be useful for people with auditory processing issues <laughs> that you, you know, don't just I say like six letters. Would have gotten it. Just say six you know? ra- random letters at people, and they're like, "Oh yeah, I'll follow you, Gene." <laughs> I and mean, like yeah I, i'm on the internet you can you can find me <laughs> you know uh my my full name is matthew davis mccreary fox and so my um on uh, the my email my personal stuff uh, i'm not gonna tell you the whole of it but it, it includes the words m d m fox which uh is, is what makes sense but i've realized some people are like wait when did you become a medical doctor it's medical doctor matthew fox like n- no no oh, not, shit. <laughs> not not what this is about well thank you both so much uh and to our listeners what do you all think like have you listened to this are you npr fans uh what do you think of some of the storylines we're talking about love to get your comments and feedback you can find all the ways to contact us 
uh, in the show notes. All the ways to contact them and all their stuff is in the show notes as well. Check it out. Uh, and of course, the best thing you can do is uh, become a member. Members for only $5 a month get uh, ad-free content. Uh, they get uh, the bonus content. Like I said, we're going to ask these folks about another geeky passion of mine that I think plays into what they're talking about. Uh, and it's also just a great way to support uh, everything that's going on. One reason why I'm able to have these guys on, which is great, as you all know, I'm supporting the strike. And so I'm not doing any uh, commentary on struck media. And so it's just wonderful to see, you know, Hollywood is not the only place that these stories are coming out of. And uh, but but the reason I say all that is that during the strike, 75, uh, 25 percent is that during the strike, 25 percent of everything that I get in through those membership fees is being donated to the strike fund that uh, helps out not only the actors and the writers themselves, but all the people who are uh, affected by the strikes, um, you know, the, the security, the caterers, uh, John, you mentioned you do prop work. I don't know if you're affected by the strike, but I know certainly there are a lot <laughs> of prop, prop people who are affected by it. The strike fund helps support all of those kind of stuff. John, yeah, are you, are you I, saying? Oh, I've taken it on the chin. I would yeah. normally be working a television show right now. So uh, my income went from, you know, 70 K a year to zero when the strikes started. So, yeah, like I, I think there's just so many ways that we're not, we don't even think about how, you know, the, the, the awful things that these studios are doing is affecting everyone. It's not just the, you know, people think, oh, you know, the writers and the actors, they get paid huge amounts of money. That's just the very top of the bill. You know, there's everything from security, the the prop masters. There's some pizza shop that I'm sure used to deliver late night pizzas to some studio in Hollywood that has just lost all its business. You know, these people, yeah. they, we need to help support it so the strike can go on and so the people can, can get what they need. So, yeah, if you become a member of this, 25% of that goes to that strike fund. Uh, throughout the strike and also just helps keep the lights on and keeps us uh give me a chance to to meet great people like max and john and hear what they're doing so please help us support the podcast please help listen and uh pass this on to your friends check out superhuman public radio it's a fantastically entertaining uh and informational and it's 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 the kind of thing that you're gonna want to pass on to people so check that out check out all the great stuff we're doing thank you all so much we have spoken